Hey everyone, this is Matt here on the Vinyl Head UK channel. I hope you are all well. I've got another classic album to show you guys. Now, I've done some videos on a couple of Sabbath records that I got sent by a very good friend of mine who goes by the name of Vic. Vic uh, was my old drum teacher. He owns a great shop down in Leamington Spa called Dr. Rum. And when I first collected or started collecting vinyls, he saw I put a post up showing off uh, the first vinyl or two that I'd got. He sent me up a message saying, I've got some vinyl for sale. Would you like it? Most of them were Sabbath records, which I snapped up. But another one that he had was this record that I've got here. It's a classic British album. We've looked at some amazing British records, some pivotal stuff. We've looked at Black Sabbath by Black Sabbath, Iron Maiden by Iron Maiden, Led Zeppelin 4. But here is another record which I think most of you will probably know and be very aware of. And that is by Deep Purple. And it is Deep Purple in Rocks. An album that saw a lineup change. From the band and also a slightly heavier sound coming from the band as well. So I have to admit, I've never really been a huge Deep Purple fan. It's not a band really I've dug into all that much if I'm honest. I could name you like the classic songs that everybody knows. But apart from that, I've never really took the time massively to sit down and listen to their stuff. Now, when Vic sent me the pictures of what he had, like I said, I snapped up the Sabbath stuff because I'm a big Black Sabbath fan. But I saw this album and I thought, you know what? Everything sounds better on vinyl, so I'm going to have to grab it off him. And I did. He sold it at a real nice price for me. It is an older uh, pressing, which I'll come on to a little bit later. But this album itself was... Uh, it was released in 1970 by Harvest, but this is a 1982 reissue uh, and it's by Fame. So we'll have a little look as we always do at the artwork there. So obviously we've got the Mount Rushmore picture with the members of the band on Mount Rushmore. Uh, it's repeated on the back. And then obviously our track listing and all our usual stuff that we have, production notes, whatever. Now, this has obviously had a couple of owners, uh, Vic being one of them and probably some owners beforehand, especially considering this is a 1982 pressing. So, Pauline Anderson, whoever you are, you must have been a prior owner because on the paper sleeve we have her name. And then Deep Purple, Deep Purple in Rock. So, she's wrote on there. Which, you know, is what it is. Doesn't bother me too much. Uh, and then we have the Fame logo. You can see there. On that we have um, our track listing. We've got EMI listed down the base. And then the second side is the same. It's not 108, it's very flimsy. It's probably the flimsiest uh, record that I actually have in my collection. So we take extra care. It has, to a degree, been looked after. I'm gonna come on to the sound of it a little bit later. Um, I'll talk about a slight defect uh, on this record, which is a little bit of a shame, but we'll come on to it. So it's the third studio album by Deep Purple. And it was the first uh, release from what we call the Mark II lineup. So uh, this saw Ian Gillen coming in for starters. So we have Ian Gillen on vocals. We have Richie Blackmore on guitar. We all know Richie Blackmore from Deep Purple and then Rainbow as well. Uh, I was lucky enough to see Richie Blackmore a couple of times a few years back. He obviously went from doing Deep Purple and Rainbow and the hard rock stuff to a real tangent by doing his uh, like folky sort of 
weird stuff that he was doing. Obviously, I don't mean weird, but you know, very different stuff. But he came back um, to do Richie Blackmore's Rainbow. I saw him a couple of times in Birmingham doing a mixture of Deep Purple and Rainbow tracks. Um, really enjoyed both times I saw him, I have to say. Uh, we had Roger Glover, who came in on bass. And then we had John Lord on organs. And then, of course, Ian Pace on drums. So, as I say, we saw Ian Gillen and Roger Glover coming in. Um, Rod Evans was vocalist before, in the sort of Mark I lineup. There was doubts over his ability to produce sort of a hard rock vocals, which was a style that definitely Richie Blackmore was pushing more towards. Um, he wanted a more hard rock sound. And yeah, Rod Evans, I think they just didn't feel he was up to the job. Um, it was kind of an underhand way of doing it. So um, I forget the original bass player's name, apologies, but Rod Evans and the original bass player were still in the band when Ian Gillen and Roger Glover were brought in. They still had outstanding tour dates. And they were starting to look at recording material whilst the previous uh, vocalist and bass player was still in the band. So it's a little bit of an underhand way of doing it. But, you know, it happened and the rest is, is history. Um, so recording took place of this album over several different studios in London, including Abbey Road. Um, they were rehearsing tracks and then taking them to a live environment, seeing if they worked in the live environment before then bringing them back to actually record, hence why they were doing it at different locations. Um, a bit of a different way of recording, you can, you know, considering how bands record or how we expect bands to record these days, it was quite an odd way, sort of gauging whether these songs did work in a live setting and audience feedback on these tracks. And then, you know, if they do work, let's go record them. If they don't work, let's scrap them. So an interesting take on recording. It's one that we don't traditionally see these days. You'll maybe see bands who um, have been recording and have got some tracks laid down and then maybe go on the road a little bit and test a couple of new ones out and, and go from there. But yeah, it's, uh, it's a different way of doing it. Interesting way of doing it, definitely. Um, and this was actually produced by Deep Purple. It was the first album of theirs to be solely produced by the band as well. I'll come on to production. It's, it's okay. It's a little bit here and there in places, but we'll come on to production uh, very shortly. So, let's look at... Track listing, shall we? So there are seven tracks all together. Three on side one, four on side two. Speed King, Bloodsucker and Child in Time. See us on side one. Quite a formidable trio of tracks there. And then Flight of a Rat, Into the Fire, Living Wreck and Hard Loving Man are on side two. It's a solid album. There isn't really a weak track, I would say. We will go through the tracks as normal and I'll talk a little bit about them. There's some interesting facts to some of these tracks, definitely. Um, but we we'll start with Speed King. So Speed King was um, initially developed as a bass riff by Roger Glover, which will be a, a theme throughout. A lot of these tracks came from Roger Glover. A lot from jams and just rehearsal sessions, jam sessions where they've started playing and then Blackmore and John Lord have added stuff over the top and then Ian Gillen's put a vocal on. But I mean, Speed King is just a hell of a way to open this record. Um, as I say, it started with a bass riff, uh, which Roger Glover wrote, and he was actually trying to copy uh, the track Fire by Jimi Hendrix and just playing about with that somewhat. Um, and then Ian Gillen, funnily enough, wrote his lyrics, but he took a lot of phrases and snippets of lyrics from Little Richard songs. So, you know, 
obviously Little Richard back then for these older bands was quite an influence. We've heard a lot of artists like Lemmy, for example, from Motorhead has come out to say how much of an influence Little Richard was. Dave Grohl's another. And so he's pulled these lyrical phrases from Little Richard songs and put them into speaking, uh, which is quite interesting. John Lord, there's an, an organ intro. Obviously, there's a lot of organ throughout, but it actually started as a piano intro as well. And then that got shifted out um, and the organ put in. Uh, but yeah, I, you can't really knock it starting off with that. Bloodsucker is quite a nice one. Um, I, I really like Bloodsucker as a track. I like the riff that opens as that kind of little drum fill at the start. And then we go into the riff, which I really like that riff. It's a great riff. Um, this, interestingly enough, uh, was re-recorded down the line with Steve Morse on guitar. And it was actually put out on the 98 album, uh, which was called Abandon and renamed. It was called Bloodsucker, but spelt B-L-U-D, Sucker. So it's quite interesting they re-recorded this. I haven't heard that version. I'd like to see how it compares to the in rock version, definitely. Um, and then the iconic track, the one that we all know, Child in Time. Um, I've spoke before about Led Zeppelin IV, that masterpiece that is Stairway to Heaven. This is in rock's masterpiece, Child in Time. It's like about 10 minutes or so long. It goes through a lot of dynamical changes. Is that even a word, dynamical? I think I've just made a word up. Who knows? That's what we're all about. Let's just have some fun. Um, but it was uh, actually written quite early on in the recording process uh, by John Lord, who started playing a track called Bombay Calling by a band called It's a Beautiful Day. And then it kind of uh, got built around that. The tempo got slowed down a little. And uh, then the lyrics that Ian Gillen brought in were actually inspired by the Vietnam War. And it kind of just built from there. It's got that lovely jazzy sound in organ coming through. It's got a really nice bluesy solo as well from Richie Blackmore in that middle passage. And then Ian Gillen, he's like the screams not as metal screams as we know today but those shrill high notes of his you can almost feel like pain especially not pain like he's hurt but emotional pain in the voice especially the later ones at the back end of a track following that bluesy passage um you know it's it's a vocal masterclass it really is it's it's just magnificent it's such a really nice track we only see three tracks on the first side mainly because child in time is quite a long track as i say it's around about the 10 minute mark we flip it over onto side two and we start with flight of the rat which was actually quite a a later song to be recorded in this progress um and it was apparently a rearrangement of Flight of a Bumblebee, which Ro uh, Roger Glover took a different spin on and rearranged it. And that's how they got Flight of a Rat. Um, but it really showcases the band massively. We see John Lord and we see Richie Blackmore trading licks almost with the, the organ and then the guitar solos. Um, Roger Glover's got that really nice bass that he's laying down, just keeping everything together. And then the track ends with almost a drum solo from Ian Pace. So it musically, it massively showcases just how brilliant these four musicians are, let alone with Ian Gillen on the top with his amazing vocals. It really showcases the band massively on this track, I think. Um, going into, into the fire, it actually developed after a conversation involving Richie Blackmore about the chromatic scale of all things, which uh, if you're not a musician, essentially the uh, chromatic scale, it's a set of 12 um, pitches or pitch classes, essentially, that are used in tonal music uh, with 
notes that are basically separated by a semitone. That's probably quite complicated. Um, I'm sure musicians will probably make more sense of that, but as kind of what the chromatic scale is, you will find it in all music. Um, but yeah, it's got a very King Crimson open in this one, I think, as well. It's it's very, if you've listened to Cr King Crimson, you'll know it's, it's definitely a nod almost to that. Um, what do we have? Living Wreck going into that. This was actually nearly left out of the recording. It's a track that they didn't think was strong. And then later in the process, they went back and went through it again and listened to it again and actually felt it it needed to be included on this record. But it was uh, very close to just being left off completely. Um, I really like Ian Pace's drum work on this one. It's, it's nothing out of this world compared to some of the drum work that he does on this. It's a really nice groove that he has going on, just fitting around Roger Glover and uh, Richie Blackmore fitting in as well. But it's simple. It's just a really nice groove, though. It's the sort of thing that, um, you know, it'd be quite a cool thing to teach to students and things like that. It's, it's just a solid... He's doing what he should be doing. It's a key thing with drummers, you know. One thing I always got taught, coming back to Vic as well, is play for the song, not play for yourself. And there are moments where drummers will go off and, you know, it's egotistical playing as such, but... With this groove, it's playing exactly what the song needs. It's simple, but so, so, so effective. And it's just such a nice groove that he's got going on. And like I say, fit in with Roger Glover. It sounds fantastic. And then we close with um, Hard Loving Man, which again came from a Roger Glover bass riff that they were just jamming around with. And then that led into... A bigger jam session which led into a song um which you know a lot of the times that's how great songs are formed it's just you play around with a riff or a pattern and then lo and behold there you have a song um and then you have that organ as it's kind of a i don't know how you describe it like a shrieky shrill organ sound which i'm not as sure on it's not to my ears that one too much that sort of shrieky noise coming through with the organ but again it's a solid track the whole album is solid how does it sound let's go on to that so as i say this is a 1982 record so it is not a first pressing it's 12 years later after this album initially came out production wise it's a little bit all over the place. It's a bit rough around the edges, but that adds to the rawness, I think. You don't sit there and think the production hampers it massively. It does give it a rawness because essentially we are going with a harder rock sound for Deep Purple compared to what they were doing previously. So that, that rough around the edges production, I think, pushes that rawness through very much. That doesn't transpond too much onto this pressing, I feel. There are points where the volume does shift. There was a moment where um, Ian Pace just played, um, not a fill, but just do 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 sort of thing on the toms. And it volume-wise, it was massively higher. I was looking at the frequencies. Um, I put a lot of these records through Audacity, which is a music um, uh, program that you can get for your laptop or whatnot, uh, like a recording program. And I was watching it and it suddenly shot high, so much higher um, on this time. And it, it took me back a little bit. Um, and there's a couple of moments like that where it's really pushing on those higher limits volume wise with a couple of the organ uh, parts coming through from John Lord as well. It was quite interesting. Most of the albums don't hit that limiter too much, very, very infrequently if they do. Whereas I found with this, and I don't know if it's because it's an older pressing, it was hitting that limiter a little bit, like like that. Duh, duh, duh. Those toms really shot up high on the limiter. It was very interesting to see. Um, dynamically on this pressing, it's fairly good. I don't know if that's because of it being an older 
pressing as well. Um, I find the dynamics are quite good on some of these older pressings. I haven't really found one that the dynamics aren't too good with the sound stage and whatnot. I find more of the modern records um, sound a lot more digital. Obviously, back in 1982, we didn't quite have that digital age. We definitely didn't have Apple or Spotify or anything like that. So it would all be analog, which, of course, does sound a lot better. But it's not bad at all. For me, getting into Deep Purple, it seemed the obvious choice. Obviously, we have Burn as well, which would be an obvious choice. But I'm glad I started with this. I'm glad that Vic sent me... This, along with some Sabbath records, we're getting the best of British, definitely. But there we have it. In Rock by Deep Purple. A pretty substantial rock, hard rock record for all you hard rock lovers. Another one that I think needs to be in your collection. There we have it. So, as always, go and hit subscribe. Plenty more content for you guys to go check out. Go and smash the like button. Hit the bell for all notifications. And as always, go and buy vinyl. Go and listen to vinyl. Deep Purple. In Rocks. They Rock. I'll catch you guys later.